Hey guys, this is Dr. Apolito, and this is for the Bio 115 class, where we're going to pick up where we left off after lecture on Tuesday. So what we're going to cover today is going to be included in the test next week, so be sure you study this stuff as if we covered it in class. So when we were uh, meeting last time, we talked about the cell, we talked about cellular life, we talked about diversity of life, we talked about cell theory, we watched that cool movie that showed you the little walkers along the microtubules and how the uh, cell kind of looks in real life in terms of the physics of how things bop around. And we learned about prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And we learned about the relative size differences between them and their simplicity and their complexity. All right, so we talked about um, just the very basics here. This is the only slide I'm showing you on the prokaryotic cells. These are the bacteria and the archaeans. Um, the archaeans are just, they, they look kind of like bacteria, but they're a little more complicated, and um, they live in extreme environments. I don't, we don't need to cover those. Um, and the only reason I'm mentioning prokaryotes is because our bodies deal with all sorts of bacteria, good ones and bad ones, uh, and neutral ones. And so it's important to understand the differences between these kinds of cells and eukaryotic cells, which is what we are. The biggest thing here, um, well, you know what, we, we already talked about this. The biggest thing is that there's no membrane-bound organelles inside. All right, everything else we talked about uh, in class already. So we covered um, all of the organelles here. We talked about the nucleus. We talked about the inner and outer membranes, the pores, the nucleolus here that allows the ribosome subunits to pop out. We learned that the outer membrane here is continuous with the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, that net-like labyrinth of uh, membrane just sitting outside the nucleus and continuous with it. We learned about the rough ER and the smooth ER. Oh, um, where's the smooth ER here? Right here. There's a smooth ER, right? It's all connected. And the reason why the rough ER is a rough ER is because it's got these little ribosomes, right? So remember, the ribosomes are made here in the nucleolus. They come out uh, through these little pores. And then some of them move on into the cytoplasm. And so you can actually, you can kind of see, let's see, there's some free ones over here. But a lot of them are studying the ER. So this is the rough ER because of the, the little ribosomes. And the smooth ER doesn't have ribosomes. And then we learned about the Golgi apparatus, the cells sorting machinery. And then we learned about vesicular traffic, how things move like a lava lamp sorry, move like a lava lamp, more or less, through these labyrinths and mazes. We learned about the lysosome. We learned about the mitochondria and its double membrane and its own DNA inside. We learned about the centrosome and its pair of centrioles. Um, and the microtubule network, right? We cover the cytoskeleton. And then we cover the peroxisome, the little bomb squad. We talked about the basal body of the flagella and the um, uh, microvilli. Okay, so, so we covered a lot of this stuff in class already. Um, so I'm gonna cruise through here and make sure that I missed or missed anything. All right, so chromatin, right? This word simply means DNA plus protein. And DNA is never found by itself in the cell. It's never naked. It's always bound to something. So that's why we don't call it DNA. We call it chromatin to signal the fact that there are these little proteins that are interacting with it. All right. And then really a chromosome, um, we didn't, I didn't say this in class, but I'll say it here, a chromosome, um, and this is actually a duplicated chromosome because it has both uh, sets of, uh, it's, the, that X shape is basically a, a duplicated chromosome, right? So an unduplicated chromosome would be more like this. All right. And actually, unless a cell is dividing in half, it never looks like this. Okay, it really, it just looks like a bunched up yarn, a uh, ball of yarn. That's why the inside of the nucleus looks like that. Okay, um, we talked about the plasma membrane. We talked about proteins embedded in the membrane, or I like to say stitched into the membrane, because in reality, that's how they are. Um, if this is the nuclear envelope, and this is the outer membrane, and here's the endoplasmic reticulum, okay, here's a ribosome. That ribosome, some of the proteins it makes get spit out over here. That's the lumen of the ER. And for those proteins, 
right, will have vesicles butt off and do their thing. And there's proteins inside here. But some proteins get really stitched into the membrane. So when those vesicles butt off, those membrane proteins are there to stay, and that's how they are delivered to the plasma membrane. And some of those proteins and some of those lipids are glycosylated, right? And that means that they have a little sugar attached to them. And so the outside of a eukaryotic cell, if this is one of our cells and that's the nucleus, the outside of our cell is just pockmarked and studded with these little sugar chains, these glycoproteins and glycolipids. Okay, we talked about phospholipids and we talked about the varying kinds of proteins embedded in the membrane. So we have channel proteins that allow things to come in and out of the cell that otherwise would bounce off. We talked about um, maybe enzyme proteins. We talked about receptors. So if you go back here, these are receptors. Okay, so this right here is the thing that binds to the receptor and that causes these other proteins to go and do a thing. All right, and then we talked about cell adhesion. We covered the fact that some, uh, some cells are bound together, uh, many cells are bound together, and there's a few types of bind bindings so, or adhesions. So we have tight junctions, right? And you can see here, these are tight junctions. And the reason they're tight junctions is that prevents water from getting in there. So water can't penetrate down into here. So for example, if this is the lumen of the gut and your liquids in here, um, these cells are impermeable to that water. They won't be able to get in because of these tight junctions. All right. In contrast, the desmosomes, which are a type of what's called an anchoring junction, these allow a mesh to, uh, uh, more like a handshake between cells, and what this allows is stretching. All right. So desmosomes allow stretching. Think of your skin, think of your lungs, think of your bladder. Um, there's the stretchy things have desmosomes. And then lastly, we have a, um, uh, this, this is the protein's name, but really these are called gap junctions. All right, so gap junctions create uh, basically a door between the two cells so that they can share information in their cytoplasm. So for example, these are critical in heart tissue. In heart muscle or cardiac muscle, all the cells are in sync electrically because of these gap junctions. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, we covered all this. All right, so the mitochondria, the ribosome, the ER. Remember the word reticulum means net-like. All right, that means net. And so don't let these big words scare you. We got endo means inside, plasmic. It's made out of membrane. So a membrane inside the cell that looks like a net. All right, that's what the ER is. And we talked about the Golgi. Um, some people pronounce it Golgi, but um, it's Golgi. At least that's how I've been raised with it. And the point of the Golgi is to act as the cell sorting machinery. And, and uh, it modifies proteins. It'll maybe cut them a little bit. It'll add some sugars to them and then ship them out across the cell. Okay, so in this, this is a good overview slide to study. Once you understand the basics of the organelles, it includes uh, most of the ones we've talked about, and it shows you some basic functions. So on the right here, this side, you can see there's a protein created in the ER. It is then put into a vesicle that then migrates to the cis side of the Golgi, where it is then modified, and then it blebs off, and you can see this vesicle fuses with the membrane and it causes a secretion. On the other side here, you can see this little food particle. This might be a little chunk of protein or sugars, and you can see a little vesicle eats it. It comes inside the cell. This is called endocytosis. And we'll talk more about that later in the semester. And so endocytosis is when things come in, and here is a lysosome. Lysosomes are born by being blubbed off the Golgi, and you can see here that it's fusing with the food particle, and these little green things in here, these are hydrolytic enzymes. These are enzymes that break things down. And so with this fusion, we now have this lysosome vessel that is now able to break down the food and build, um, and then use it to make energy, right? Okay, so, well, really, it doesn't make energy in here. I just, I make, I'm talking quick and dirty here. This is really, this will create little smaller pieces that then go and get metabolized, right? Ultimately, though, energy is 
uh, created in the cytoplasm and in the uh, mitochondria. We talked about lysosomes. These are cells. I just talked about these. I can skip that. These are basically the garbage disposals of the cell. We talked about peroxisomes. These are the bomb squads of the cells. Okay, so where lysosomes degrade things that are just normal waste of proteins and lipids and whatnot, the peroxisomes degrade high level, or rather high energy molecules that would otherwise be dangerous to cells. Okay, so peroxisomes are found in cells that detoxify things. So you can imagine that a liver cell, for example, the liver helps us detoxify poisons. And so those cells would have a lot of peroxisomes in them. We talked about the cytoplasm. All right, now remember there's a slide here. This has an error to it. Remember that microfilaments, which are made of actin, okay, right here, actin filaments, these are the smallest ones, not the largest ones. So this is smallest. All right, and then an the intermediate or in the middle, they're still in the middle. And then the microtubules, these are the largest, okay? So small, medium, large. And so there's your actin, there's your um, intermediate filaments, and there's your mic uh, microtubules. So uh, actin filaments or microfilaments are made out of a single protein called actin. Okay, there's actin's structure. Um, this is the tertiary structure of actin, if you remember your protein structure. And then this twisted helix here, similar, kind of looks like DNA, right? This would be its quaternary structure, this higher order structure. Intermediate filaments, there's a whole family of these. So the one that you can remember as we covered in class is keratin. Right? And this is what your hair and nails is made of. And then the microtubules are made out of a protein called tubulin. And actually there's an alpha and a beta tubulin. And so this little double thing turns and uh, acts as the subunit to build these hollow big cylinders. All right. I don't expect you to know this, by the way. It's just good enough to know what tubulin is, know what actin is, and know what keratin is, as an example. Okay. Also understand not all cells have intermediate filaments. Um, so you'll find these in, say, like your skin cells. Your skin cells are rich in uh, intermediate filaments because they give them strength. All right. Uh, we talked about the centrioles, and we talked about the centrosome. The centrosome is that central body of the cell. This is what gives it its sh shape. This is where microtubules come off of, etc. Okay. Um, then we talked about cell extensions. We understand that cilia and flagella are both essentially the same thing. Um, we learn microvilli are these extensions of the plasma membrane that increases the surface area, which in turn increases absorption of materials. And then we, don't, we pretty much left off here. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. No, then we went through the different basic cell types of the body. Now, remember, the, the human body has over 200 different cell types. So these are just kind of examples of those 200, like a quick survey of them. So, for example, fibroblasts and erythrocytes, are these are kinds of cells that help connect the body parts. And we had that little discussion in class about how exactly blood connects the body. Um, we talked about skin cells, the epithelium, and how these are packed into sheets. This will actually be our very first system that we start covering after the first test. So we'll learn more about that later. We learned about muscle cells. There's not much to say here. We'll learn more about those as well, um, actually, in a few minutes. And actually, um, we'll, we'll talk more about these kinds of cells as we do tissues. So I'm going to gloss over the rest of this now. We left off about here. We talked about reproduction a bit. We had a good conversation there about species and what a species is. And then we left off here. All right, so, so here we go. So we understand a cell now. We understand the parts of a cell. We can sit here and we can doodle a cell. We can talk about the ER. We can do the Golgi, the lysosomes, the peroxisomes, the vesicular traffic, you know, all the, all the stuff in a cell. And so understand, once we have this thing, okay, the cell, once we have the cell, it does things, okay? It metabolizes. That means it brings food in, it breaks it down, it uses that food to do energy, it excretes waste, right? So it's digesting food, it's getting rid of waste. Um, it is, well, you know, sometimes cells reproduce. So one cell becomes two cells. Um, and then when we say a cell grows, it's not just the cell that's growing, but it's the it's the individual multicellular organism. So you grow. You don't grow by having your cells get bigger. 
necessarily. You grow by having more cells, right? You just keep getting more and more cells. So they, you know, as we said earlier, the average human body has 32 trillion cells, right? And that came from one cell. So that is a lot of work to get there, right? And uh, of course, cells move and organisms move. These are basically the things we talked about in the first chapter, if you remember. Okay. All right. So let's see. We're talking about now cell physiology. So really, we push play. What do cells do when they um, when they live? And the first concept here is membrane transport. Okay. So membrane transport is when we have a cell and we have things go across the membrane. All right. Either they're coming into the cell or they're leaving the cell. So to understand the basics of this, it's good to review these chemistry concepts of solutions and solvents and solutes. I'm not going to teach this to you again right now. You can go back to your chemistry chapter and you can learn about those. Understand that we have biological fluids. All right. So most of these things are solutions. For example, inside your cell, all right, we have what's called the cytosol. If this is a cell and this is a nucleus, this here, this whole area is called, if you remember, the cytoplasm, the inside of the cell. The cytoplasm has two basic components, the cytoskeleton, okay, those are your actin and microtubules and intermediate filaments, and then you have the liquid part. The liquid part is what's called the cytosol. All right, this is one of the many biological fluids in our body. Inside the nucleus is this very dense gel-like material called the nucleoplasm. Okay, so you have chromatin in here, and you have nucleoplasm in here. Okay, and then, if so, if this is a bunch of cells on your skin or whatever, we can talk about liquid outside the cells. All right, so we call this interstitial fluid. All right, this includes the lymph. All right, all lymph is, is the liquid component of blood that has squirted out into the tissue. So if this is a blood vessel, all right, and there's blood moving through this. As the heart pumps, it's lots of pressure come out. There's your blood pressure, and some of that pressure causes the liquid to ooze out into the surrounding tissue. And that's actually how all these cells get their oxygen and their sugars and everything. And then there's this duct system in the tissue that collects that fluid and eventually brings it back to the heart. And that's your lymphatic system. Okay? Understand, too, the membrane itself of a cell is what we call semi-permeable. You might see the term selectively permeable. And what that means is some stuff, again, okay, so if this is a cell, some stuff gets in and some stuff gets stuck and some stuff gets bounced, okay, depending on the rules here. So, for example, if it's small and not charged, if it's uncharged, Okay, and so an example of that might be um, lipids, and it might be water, it might be um, ox the, really the key ones, oxygen gas and carbon dioxide, right? So all these things here are small enough to sneak into the cell freely. They diffuse into the cell. But then you have small things that are charged, like chloride ions, okay? Um, or sodium ions or potassium ions. In those cases, those will either stick if they're um, the same charge as the cell, or so, so the membrane itself, you can kind of imagine the membrane itself being slightly negatively charged. Okay, so you can imagine chlorine is going to bounce off like this, and sodium and potassium will stick here, but they're not going to go in. They can't go in because they're charged. And then big things. Big things like big proteins or um, other cells, okay, those are too big to get in. And so in those cases, you need help. And so that's where those proteins come in, those channel proteins or those carrier proteins. They also allow the ions to come in. So for example, there's the sodium potassium pump you might have heard about, the NAK pump. And that allows some things in and some things out. So really, that's a net... Um, but you know what? Uh, it's beyond the scope of this class. We'll just right now, we'll talk about this when we do nerves, when we do neurons. Um, but for now, just understand that some things can get into the cell, and some things get stuck to the cell, and some things bounce. Okay? And for the things that can't get into the cell, there are proteins 
that will facilitate their import. If they're going downhill, that's called facilitated diffusion because it doesn't require energy. And if they're going against a gradient, then they're called pumps because they require energy. Okay, oh, so I realize we have some slides talking about this. So passive processes don't require energy. That's as simple as diffusion. Okay, so here you go. Here's a good summary of all of this. On the left here, you have diffusion. So for example, these might be little lipid droplets or water molecules. Um, really, let's, well, forget water right now. That's going to be over here. So think of these as um, anything that's uh, gas. Okay, oxygen gas here. That's the best example for this. So oxygen is going to freely go in. Carbon dioxide will freely go out. All right, so that's diffusion. Osmosis is simply the diffusion of water molecules going from regions of high concentration to low concentration. All right, and so one way to facilitate osmosis, there are these proteins in our cells called aqua, there's water, aquaporins. So basically water pores. All right, so now for things that can't get into the cell because they're too big, like proteins, we have what are called carrier proteins. Okay, so proteins helping proteins get into the cell, basically. Sometimes we call these channels, and sometimes we call these um, carriers, depending on how they operate. All right, so, well, so, okay, so here's, here's the carrier proteins. You can see here, carrier proteins are more like a mechanical device, whereas channel proteins are more like big gaping holes in the wall. All right. All right, so now let's talk for a second about osmosis here. When water diffuses into a cell, all right, so let's take this example here. here. Here's how osmosis works in a nutshell. Let's say that we have a beaker of water. And inside that beaker, we have this little, um, this little twist tied thing that looks like a candy wrapper. But this is made out of a clear membrane and this membrane allows water to freely pass across the membrane, but it doesn't let the particles out, okay? And so let's say that the inside of this has a lot of stuff, lots of salts and sugars. Think of a cell, all right? And then the outside here, the liquid out here, doesn't have nearly as much stuff, all right? So let's think about comparing this liquid to that liquid, all right? The liquid inside the wrapper has more stuff in it, right? And so we're going to call that hypertonic. And in contrast, the solution outside the wrapper that hardly has anything, we're going to call that hypotonic. All right, so what's really going on here is any of these substances, the salts and the sugars, if we zoomed into that, let's say this is a piece of uh, sugar, water is going to interact with this, okay? Water is gonna stick to this because they like each other. They both have polar bonds. Because of this, anything that's dissolved in water is going to act as a sort of sponge. It's going to take the water out of play. So there's free water, which is the water floating around, free water, and then there's bound water, water that can't move. So now that you understand that, think of what's happening in here, okay? In here, you have a lot of these solute particles. The water that's bound to those solute particles can't move across the membrane, right? And so they're gonna be trapped in here. They're gonna be stuck. So. Think about free water now. Think of the water that's able to move everywhere. Which area, the hypertonic or the hypotonic, has more free water? You think about that. Okay, the outside here doesn't have a lot of salt or sugars or whatever, and so it's gonna have a lot of free water. Hypotonic has a lot of free water. And in contrast, in contrast, the hypertonic doesn't have a lot of free water. It's got a lot of bound water. And so really osmosis, you can think of, is the diffusion of free water. So the water is going to tend to go in here. All right. One easy way to think of this is water, H2O, follows salt. Okay. And the last way of thinking of it is let's say that you had two beakers of water. Let's say that you had two beakers of water 
and they were salt water. Okay, this one you had 5% salt water, and this one you had 10% salt water, right? So this one's saltier. So this one would be the hypertonic, right? And this one would be the hypotonic. So my question to you would be, how can we make these equal to each other? Okay, by the way, equal to means isotonic. How can we make them equal to each other? Well, you can imagine if I poured a little bit of this into here and a little bit of that into there, I will eventually make them equal to each other, right? So in other words, by mixing the two solutions, they can become even over time, all right? Now, if you have a cell and you have a surrounding environment, you can't exactly do that, right? So instead what happens is the water moves across and the water causes the concentration to become the same. Okay, so now that you kind of understand that, hopefully, imagine putting a red blood cell into a solution where there was just pure water. So lots of salt in here. What's going to happen? The water is going to flow into the cell. And what's going to happen to that? Well, that's when you get lysis. Okay, a lysed cell. This is what happens to red blood cells when you put them in pure water or water that doesn't have a lot of salt. Okay. Our cells like to be in an isotonic solution where there's an equal amount of stuff in the cell and out of the cell. Okay, now if you drop our cells in salt water, the opposite's going to happen. The cells are going to actually lose water and they're going to shrivel. Okay, so that's osmosis. That's all about the movement of water. And understand that osmosis does not require energy. All it requires is in a barrier where the, the water can move across it, but the stuff can't. Okay, and it requires a concentration difference of that stuff inside and outside. Okay, but you don't need to add any energy to it. Now, in addition to diffusion, this, this random, this uh, energy passive uh, concept, there's also something called filtration. And we already kind of touched on filtration before. When the heart pumps, all right, this fluid leaks into the tissue that's filtration, that leakage, okay? And then eventually the lymph nodes and the, du I'm sorry, the lymphatic ducts, ducts uh, collect that fluid and then eventually return it to the, uh, the heart, okay? And so the opposite of filtration too is also called reabsorption where some of the fluid will also come back in here, okay? All right, now let's talk about active transport. These are the energy dependent mechanisms. Um, and there's two basic ways to think of this. The first is, is protein carriers, as we talked about earlier. Now, I don't need you to know the details of how the sodium potassium pump works. Don't worry about for every three sodiums that come in, okay, two potassiums come in. I'm sorry, for every three sodiums that leave, two potassiums come in. Okay, just understand that what we're doing is we're pumping sodium against its gradient. In other words, there's more, more sodium out here and less in the cell, but we're still pumping out. We're trying to get rid of it. Okay, and then the potassium is actually, there's more potassium outside of the cell than in, and yet we want to pump it in. Okay, so those relative concentration differences, you can actually see those right here. Okay, green represents potassium and yellow represents sodium. All right, so burning energy, what that does is it pumps these things so that we have a net gain of the original potassium. All this basically does is it puts three pluses out and brings two pluses in. And so what that's going to do over time, right, if I gave you $3 and then you give me $2 and I give you $3 and you give me $2, over time I'm going to lose money right? I'm giving you three, you're giving me two. So overall, the inside of a cell becomes negatively charged because of the sodium potassium pump, okay? All right, in addition to proteins requiring energy, so this, this carrier protein stuff, there's also something called vesicular traffic, all right? So imagine instead of the cell's membrane having a door in it, let's just pull some membrane off itself, okay? So that's what vesicular traffic's all about. Exocytosis is when things leave the cell. And so this is a cell, and this is a vesicle that's butted off the Golgi apparatus, for example. Eventually it will fuse to the cell and it will secrete something. Exo, exit cytosis, exocytosis. 
Okay? The opposite of exocytosis is endocytosis, where things come into the cell. There's endocytosis. Okay? And there's two kinds. Phagocytosis, some people will pronounce that phagocytosis, is when big chunks of stuff come in. Okay? Or sometimes even cells, like a white blood cell eating a bacterial cell. This is called phagocytosis. Okay, so there's two kinds of endocytosis, one being phagocytosis, and then the other is when there's little par particles, little solute particles. Okay, pinocytosis, right? Pino, cellular drinking. So think of like wine, pino, pino uh, wine, and there's your mem memory of uh, endocytosis, so cell drinking and cell eating. All right. Now, cell division, okay, this is another thing cells do. We're not spending any time on this. I'm going to tell you one slide, and this is the basics of cell division. This is an entire lecture in a normal biology class, right? But we're going to gloss over this for now. The idea is simply, okay, here's the concept. Cells do not normally divide unless you tell them to, okay? And so a cell is usually just hanging out in this state called G0, when a cell is told to grow by some kind of factor, okay, so there's a hormone, for example, a protein hormone called a mitogen. A mitogen is something that tells a cell, hey, time to wake up and divide. That pushes the cell from that G0 into G1, the first growth stage. Okay, so G0 is living outside the cell cycle. Cells aren't dead here. They're maintaining homeostasis, they're burning energy, they're fixing their DNA, they're just not dividing, okay? When they're told to grow, they enter the first growth phase. The first growth phase job is to prepare the cell to divide its DNA in the next phase, which is called the synthesis phase, or S phase. This is when DNA synthesis occurs. Once the cell finishes dividing its DNA, it then goes into a second growth phase, called the G2 phase. And during the G2 phase, the cell is preparing itself to get ready to divide its nucleus, which is called mitosis. It's also going to get ready to go through and divide its cyto uh, cytoplasm, called cytokinesis. All right, so this last phase is called the M phase, or the mitotic phase. Now, it's important to understand mitosis itself, and we're not going into the motor details here, the prophase and metaphase and anaphase and telophase, we're not talking about any of that today. Instead, what I want to say is mitosis is not cell division. Mitosis is simply nuclear division. Okay? Nuclear division. And so when a cell divides, it divides its nucleus and it divides its cytoplasm. That's what cytokinesis is. Okay? So together, cytokinesis and mitosis give us the M phase, and that's what results in two cells, all right? Now, as long as those growth factors are still present, each one of these cells will then go through the cycle again, and again, and again, and again. And so that's how we go from the one cell, to the two cells, to the four cells, to the da, 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 32 trillion cells, right? Okay. And then one last thing, just as a fun fact, cells that start this process but something goes wrong, like let's say they get damaged during their DNA synthesis uh, process, or let's say that while they're just hanging out in G2, they get damaged, or the chromosomes start doing something funky. The cell will actually remove itself from the cell cycle and kill itself in a process called apoptosis. And that's how you pronounce that, apo or apoptosis, not ptosis. That's P is silent, right? So it's apoptosis and this is programmed cell death this is the kind of death that happens naturally this is what your skin cells are doing this is what your gut cells are doing this is what your hair cells are doing and every second of every single day there are a hundred thousand cells in your body going through apoptosis and then another hundred thousand of them going through mitosis okay so you could kind of think of life right now at the steady state as mitosis and apoptosis being the uh, in homeostatic equilibrium, all right? If you have too much mitosis, you get cancer, right? That's when things grow when they're not supposed to. And if you have too much apoptosis, then you have what's called neurodegenerative uh, disease, things like AIDS or muscular dystrophy, etc. okay?
And during S phase, we have what's called DNA replication. And again, this is a whole nother lecture, and we're not going to get into the details. You understand the basics of DNA, right? So you understand that the DNA double helix is actually two nucleic acids bound together by hydrogen bonding, right? If you remember that. And that you remember that when you pull this apart, you can actually, so here, I'm going to take this and I'm going to untwist it so it looks like a ladder, right? So let's say that's A, T, that's T, A, that's C, G, that's G, C, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just put a bunch of these base pairs together, okay? Now imagine I pull that apart, right? And I get something that looks like this. It's almost like a ruler, right? And then this side, it's a complement of that, right? So what's really cool here, this is, this is kind of mind-blowing, is that when you pull the DNA apart, each one of those double strands, I'm sorry, each one of those single strands has the same information on it, right? If this is, say, A, T, G, C, C, and this one, therefore, you know it's T, A, C, G, G. And why do you know that? Because remember that A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G, no exceptions. And so the way DNA replicates itself, it will pull itself apart like this, Okay, and then it will read along here and create new DNA strands. So eventually we get two. So you can see here, here's the single strand. Here it is opening up, and then here it is making new ones. Okay, so this happens to every single chromosome during S phase. And that's all we have to say about that. And then protein synthesis is another lecture, and I'm going to give you a very brief summary. So if this is a cell, and this is the nucleus, inside the nucleus there's D DNA, okay? So there's your DNA. And let's say this is a gene. The gene gets read in a process called transcription. There's transcription. What transcription does, sorry, what transcription does is it makes a piece of RNA. And really, that's the definition of a gene. A gene is any sequence of DNA that codes information to make an RNA. Right? And if you remember, there's messenger RNA, there's transfer RNA, and there's ribosomal RNA. All right, if you need a, pre, uh, a refresher on that, go back and look at the ribosome slide and your notes from that. So once the RNA is made, in particular, the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA, after some processing, gets spit out into the cytoplasm. Okay, so there's your RNA, there's your messenger RNA. Once that happens, the ribosomes, which you remember, they're produced in the nucleolus, they come out and they bind to this messenger RNA. And then with the help of the tRNA, the transfer RNA, the ribosome will read along the messenger RNA and as it reads along, it will produce the protein product, okay? And that process is called translation. The ribosome is translating the information in the messenger RNA, which is in the language of nucleic acids. It's translating it to the language of proteins, okay? So overall, this is how you think of it. DNA gets transcribed to RNA, which gets translated to protein. Okay, and they call this, this basic concept here, so this is transcription, this is translation. They call this the central dogma of molecular biology. Once this was discovered and figured out, which happened just a few decades ago, DNA's double helix was discovered in the 50s, and then transcription and translation was elucidated in the 60s. Um, and by the early 70s, we really had a good full understanding of this. Artificial DNA was developed in the 70s, and things have just snowballed from there. Okay, so that's what makes the world go round. All right, we are now at body tissues. So I'm going to pause here, um, and you can take a break if you want. And now we're back. We're going to do body tissues. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because as we go through the rest of the semester, we're going to continue learning about this stuff. So look at this as a, just a quick survey of the tissues in the body. Okay, so there's basically four fundamental types of tissues. And now, by the way, this is where we diverge from a traditional general biology class 
into the realm of anatomy and physiology. Okay, so you can kind of draw a line in your head. If we continue talking about cells and genetics and all that, that's biology. That's general bio. You know, that's what you learn in a general biology class. Now what we're doing is, is we're focusing on the human body specifically, um, or really the mammalian body, and we're going to learn about how those different cells come together and form these higher order structures, these tissues. Okay, so by definition, a tissue itself is simply a collection of cells that have a purpose. That's the simplest way to think of it. Okay, so for example, there's your skin tissue, your epithelial tissue. That's the mo that's probably the most that that is the most common kind in your body, epithelial tissue. And then you have um, you know what I don't want to say it's the most common. Actually, by mass, connective tissue is the most common. Um, this this is probably the most familiar because you know it's your skin. So so we have our connective tissue. And this is what holds things together. And then we have to move, right? And so we have muscle tissue. We have to move things. That's all muscle does is move things, whether it's moving your body or it's moving your blood with your heart or it's moving your lungs, it's moving things. And then we basically have to control those muscles. And so we need a, a system in place to move the muscles. And that's really how nervous tissue arose. And of course, nerves now do other things like help us cognate in our brains and use our imagination. But really, the fundamental purpose of nervous tissue is to help move the muscle tissue. Okay? So we're going to walk through each one of these. The first ones we're going to talk about is epithelial tissue. This is your skin. All right? So your skin, your epithelium includes your body coverings, but it also includes the linings inside. Right, so the things that cover your heart and your liver and your lungs and all that. And it also includes glands, glandular tissue, right? So things like your lymph nodes and your uh, pineal gland, things that produce um, things like hormones, all right? It also includes things that produce, say, wax or oils in your, in your skin. All right, so what, is, what, what, what does epithelium do? It protects your body. It protects your organs, okay? It helps absorb things. So think about um, uh, when you eat, you have food getting absorbed through your intestines. When your blood is pumping through your body, all the cells are absorbing things on those initial surfaces. Okay? We talked about filtration already earlier, and we talked about secretion already. So the hallmarks of them. So as we go through these four tissues, there's going to be a slide that gives you this basic stuff, where it is, what it does, and some basic defining characteristics. So the hallmarks of epithelial tissue. It covers and lines body surfaces, right? That kind of, that's kind of obvious. Um, it's usually in sheets. That's also pretty obvious, okay? And so we'll learn about the details here. We'll cover this stuff in the next few slides. Um, and important to understand, though, it's avascular. There's no blood supply, okay? So you have to bring the blood to it by um, filtration, okay? And then another key hallmark of epithelial tissue, and this is probably one of the most important, is that it regenerates. Uh, and again, with a little, <laughs> a little asterisk here, right? if it's well-nourished, right? This is why you might get a cut on the bottom of your foot, or you're an older person and you have poor blood circulation, and your wounds are unhealing so quickly, that's usually because it's not well nourished. All right, so let's make sure we understand how we classify the many, many kinds of epithelial tissue. There's two basic ways you can think of it. There's the kind of cell it's made out of, okay? So the shape of the cell, and there's how many layers there are. All right, so first let's consider the layers. If you just have a single layer of cells, we call that simple epithelial, all right? If we have more than one layer, multiple layers, we call that stratified epithelial, okay? Now, the epithelial cells are always snug on top of some surface. We call this the basal surface, okay? The basal surface is the connecting to the body. So for example, if it's a blood vessel, Okay, the basal surface would be on the inside if we're talking about those endothelial cells here. The basal surface would be on the outside if we're talking about the cells on the outside of that vessel. Okay, so there's a basal surface, so this connects it to the body. And then there's the apical surface. The apical surface is the surface that's exposed to the environment, whether that environment is the air, 
or that environment is the lumen of your gut, for example. Okay, so that's the basics of the layers. Now let's talk about the shapes. Really, there's three basic shapes. There are squishy flat cells like pancakes. So we talk about squamous cells that look like fish scales. Then there's chunkier cells, the cuboidal cells, all right? And then there's taller cells, columnar cells. So let's talk about just the simple epithelia right now. You can just take each one of the cells we just talked about, the squamous, the cuboidal, and the columnar, and just keep those as a simple surface. So we have simple squamous tissue, we have simple cuboidal, and we have simple columnar. Okay, And so now you can understand that each one of these simple tissues is found in certain places and does basically the same thing. All right, so for example, simple squamous is involved in diffusion, filtration, secretion. Um, so for example, um, and the very, very surfaces of your lungs, right, where gas exchange occurs. You'll see very thin, so in the alveoli of this, the, uh, the lungs, you'll see simple squamous cells. Simple cuboidal cells are found in all your glands and your kidneys. And simple columnar, this is what your uh, gut tract is lined with, essentially. Okay? And so basically, where the simple squamous tissue is all about um, moving things across very easily, and that's it. And that makes sense, right? It's thin. So you want it to be th uh, thin. Form follows function, as we said over and over again. Um, where, in contrast, the simple cuboidal and columnar tissues, those are also things that allow for such as uh, mucus production, for example. Okay? Or they might have cilia. Now we can talk about stratified epithelium. All right? So these are cell layers where there's two or more um, uh, levels, so to speak, right? So they're stratified squamous, they're stratified cuboidal, and they're stratified columnar. Okay, now understand that most of the stratified epithelium we have in our bodies is squamous cell, okay? The other thing to point out is that when you talk about stratified epithelium, we name it after the very, very top cells. So there are situations when we say have cuboidal or columnars, but then there are some layers of the squamous. And so that would still be stratified squamous. Okay. And the stratified cuboidal and columnar, that's pretty rare in us. We only find it in a few glands. Like the, uh, the one I know about is the ureter and the penis. So let's see. Okay. So in addition to the simple epithelium and the stratified epithelium, the very straightforward stuff, there's also some other kind of miscellaneous versions. So there's glandular epithelium cells. Okay, glandular epithelium cells help us secrete things or produce, well, secrete things. I'll just say that. And so there's two basic kinds. Exocrine glands are glands that allow us to literally excrete things out into the world. So think about sweat. Think about oil. Okay. And they have a duct. They have a hole that lets them come out. The endocrine glands, they are ductless glands. They don't have a hole, and instead these are cells that excrete things, say, into the blood. Okay, so we'll learn more about the endocrine system later in the semester. All right, so that's glandular epithelium. Then we have what's called pseudo or false stratified columnar epithelium. And the reason why this is pseudo stratified is take a note here that the nucleus of each one of these cells is not in the same plane. So if we go back and we look at something like uh, the simple columnar epithelium, okay, you notice that all the nuclei are kind of in the same place, and that's common for all these cell types. All right, even here, you can see they're all kind of like neatly stacked, okay? You can, and you can see that under the microscope. In contrast, pseudostratified, notice that the nuclei are kind of all over the place here. Right, you can see here. So it, at first blush, it looks like it might have multiple layers of cells, but as it turns out, it's just one layer, and that's why we call it pseudo. So it, it's not one; it's not multiple layers. It's just one, but it looks like it might be. So it's pseudo stratified. Okay, and this is where, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Speaking of the respiratory tract, while I cough, <coughs> we find the pseudo stratified um, in our respiratory tract. And you can see it's also ciliated, right? There are all the cilia there. 
And then lastly, we have transitional epithelium cells. Transitional epithelium cells are cells that have some kind of modification such that the cells themselves can swell. They can change shape and stretch. And so these are the kinds of cells we find in our urinary system, so our bladder can get bigger. We find these in our lungs, so our lungs can get bigger, etc. All right, so that's epithelium tissue. Okay, let's try to move through this a little faster here. Um, what I want you to do as you teach yourself this stuff is when you use Bosch appliances, just get you can be the really quite precise basics down. In terms of how okay, you cook, location, you're function, hallmarks, understand the basics. The There's the nothing the in these slides so nice that is complicated. Um, I love Bosch no appliances really, because really to me they're another ingredient. In the so dish. what I'm going to do now it's is I'm just going to cruise through these slides for the last three types of tissues um, and save us all the trouble and you can get back to your study. So the connective tissues, these are the tissues in your body that to connect everything. I mean, really, there's there's no other way to say that. So bone, right? The bones are connected to each other. You have cartilage, which is relatively rare. We have a few places of cartilage, but most stuff is bone. And then we have dense and loose connective tissue. Okay? The dense connective tissue we're going to talk about, those are your ligaments and your tendons. And we're going to talk about loose connective tissue, which is what we find is a spider webby substance that kind of binds all of the organs together. And then there's blood, which is technically a connective tissue, and that fills all of your tissues, just surrounding everything is blood. Blood's everywhere. All right, so bones are made out of osteocytes, so that's the specific cell type, okay? And a lacuna, uh, lacunae, these are basically little pockets that have the cells growing in them, all right? And so from the lacunae, the osteocytes secrete this very hard matrix made of calcium, and that's why your bones are hard, okay? Um, and in addition to the, um, the calcium salts, there's also a lot of protein fibers in there. So bone is this very, very strong supple material. Um, and that's all I'll say about bone. And cartilage is a little rare. It's basically um, kind of like bone, but a little softer. Um, you know, if you wiggle your nose, your, your nose has some cartilage in it, and then your ribs have this lining of cartilage, and this is what allows them to be flexible. You know, you need your rib cage to expand along with the rest of your body when you breathe. Um, and then you also find this stuff in between your um, vertebrae, right, in your um, discs. So it's basically, it's softer than bone, and it's more flexible than bone, and the cell types here, instead of osteocytes, are called chondrocytes. Okay. Then there's dense connective tissue, and these are your ligaments and your tendons. And then underneath your, um, your epidermis, you have your dermis, the lower skin layer. And so the, the key here, I think the most important part of the dense connective tissue is understanding the difference between a ligament and a tendon. A lot of people get confused by this. Um, and so a ligament is something that connects um, bone to bone, okay? And tendons connect bones to muscles. And it's that simple. They're made out of the same stuff. We just call these things different because they have different functions. Okay? And the biggest, most important cell that is within the dense connective tissue is called the fibroblast. These produce the collagen fibers. Okay? The other thing to point out here is that dense connective tissue is not vascularized. There's not a lot of blood in here. And so when you rip a tendon or you rip a ligament, it takes a long time to heal, and sometimes they don't ever fully heal because there's not a rich supply of blood getting there. Then there's loose connective tissue. In loose connective tissue, it's basically a lot of space, a lot of gaps in there. And so think about your, um, your adipose tissue. That's an example of a connective tissue, okay? So your fat tissue. So in the human breast, there's all this, um, it looks like irregularly shaped chaotic cells. And adipose tissue is basically filled with cells called adipocytes that um, basically have a huge reservoir of little oil droplets, the, the fats. Okay? And so, one thing to understand is that when we gain weight and we lose weight, we're not gaining or losing cells, we're increasing or decreasing the size of the cells we have. Okay? So, when you lose weight, you're simply removing the stuff from inside these cells. So everybody has a, their own set number of these cells, okay? Then you have uh, areolar tissue, 
which is where most of the tissue in your body is. Okay, this is basically the glue that holds everything together. Um, and then you have reticular tissue, which is relatively rare. This is what's inside your organs themselves and forms basically their, the basis of their, um, uh, their structure. Okay, so, so that's loose connective tissue. Then we got blood, okay? And we all know a lot about blood for the most part being in this class, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it. There's the plasma, the liquid component, and then there's the matrix, okay? Which is fluid in this case, right? Ah, so actually that's one thing I forgot to mention here, and that's with connective tissue, you generally have a matrix of some kind, okay? So in, um, let's see, so in bone, the matrix is made of calcium and some collagen. In cartilage, it's made, I think, mostly out of um, uh, fibroblasts again, collagen again. And then in uh, dense connective tissue, once again, it's collagen. And loose connective tissue, it is various things, I believe. Let me see if I can find the, um, I think it depends on, uh, it depends on the cell type, but also it's probably just fibroblasts again and uh, the collagen. And then in blood, it's different. The matrix is liquid. And the only time you see the fibers is when you have a blood clot, right? So unless you have a, a genetic predisposition towards something like hemophilia, where you're unable to form clots, um, you will find the fibers in the little plugs, uh, the blood clot, which are eventually replaced by a scab, right? So the matrix is liquid, and that's why we call it the plasma, the blood plasma. This is the stuff that leaks out of the vesicles and gives us our interstitial fluid, our lymph, okay? And basically what blood does is it transports oxygen to all of our cells because all of our cells need oxygen. It transports our sugars, it gives us our salts, it makes sure the pH of everything is right. And then it's also filled with all sorts of defensive cells, these white blood cells. There's a whole army in here. We have macrophages and we have lymphocytes and we have eosinophils and we have basophils. We have all sorts of white blood cells whose job is to protect us from foreign invaders like bacteria, like little worms, like little um, viruses, etc., etc. All right, and then we have muscle tissue, and I'm not going to spend too much time here other than these are the cells that allow us to move. And there's basically three kinds. Skeletal muscle, the most common, this is voluntary muscle. What that means is it's under your control. You can consciously move your arm or move your eyes or stand up and sit down. When you look at this tissue, the cells have these striations in them or these stripes. These, and these stripes are basically... Um, actin filaments, microfibers, and so we'll talk about that when we get to the muscle si uh, muscle system. Okay, and then you have cardiac tissue, which is only found in the heart. And the difference here is that in addition to being involuntary, right, you can't consciously stop your heart in a heartbeat, no pun intended. Um, and it, uh, like skeletal muscles, it also has striations, but the cells are a little shorter. But really, the, uh, oh, and they're branching, okay? So unlike skeletal muscle, they have, um, they have shapes to them that branch a little bit. But here's the coolest part. They have these gap junctions that connect all the cells. So we talked about these earlier today. And so gap junctions allow the heart to basically act as one big collective cell, which is pretty cool. And then lastly, we have smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is muscle that we don't control. So right now, as you're talking and thinking and, and or listening to this rather, you have what's called peristalsis going on in your gut. And these are waves of muscle contraction that move your food and the fluids throughout your gut and eventually ending up in um, your butt. And then you have peristalsis and you have conscious muscles that you can push uh, to get your uh, feces out. Okay, so that's a smooth muscle. Um, and then, of course, there's some muscle that's a little of both. Like, for example, your lungs, your breathing, okay? The muscles that control your breathing, like your diaphragm, that's a combination of the skeletal and smooth muscles because you can't, um, so you can consciously hold your breath, right? But if you're not thinking, it just goes into kind of a cruise control, right? So things aren't as simple as just these three different muscles, but this gives you a taste of it. All right, and then lastly, you have nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is basically the cells that control the muscles 
control our thoughts, if you want to think of it that way as well. And basically, it's just made out of two cell types, fundamentally. There's neurons, which allow the um, electricity to flow through it. And then there's the neuroglia cells, or what I like to just call them the glial cells. And the glial cells basically feed the neurons. Okay, now here's a fun fact. You've probably all heard humans only use 10% of their brain. All right, what that myth comes from is there was a guy long ago, back in the early 1900s, that asked the question, how much of the brain is made of neuron? And so he pulled out the neurons, he, pulled, he teased them out, and he weighed them. And it turns out 10% of the brain is neuron, and 90% of the brain is neuroglia cells. So we use 100% of our brain, right? Although maybe some of us more than others, um, but there's no secret untapped 90% of the human brain that's sitting there ready to be woken up and used for all sorts of cool things like telekinesis and uh, extrasensory perception. Okay, now I'm not sitting here saying that those things don't necessarily exist, you know, you know, ESP and all that. Who knows what kind of stuff our brains are capable of? What I can tell you is there's no current scientific evidence to support any of those claims. Unfortunately, wouldn't it be nice to be able to move things with your brain, right? But so anyway, that's that's a little fun fact I always like uh, talking about is that whole 10% myth. It's totally a myth. And the reason why it's a myth and, and it perpetuated was the press back then or some journalist or some writer got hold of that experiment and he's like, wait, we only have 10% neuron. We only use 10% of our brains. And then it was, well, what do we use the other 90% for? I don't know. And it's really, they're supporting cells. That's it. And despite the fact this was debunked shortly after it was published, so we're talking like 1920, it's still something that we talk about and some people think about there's even a movie called lucy if you google that if you haven't heard of it before i'd never watched it i couldn't get past the trailer when morgan freeman's voice was saying we only use 10 percent of her brain i'm like no that's just that's not true and the whole movie was based on that so i couldn't watch it <laughs> in any case what does it do nervous tissue allows us to basically see our environment to sense our environment and then to respond to it all right so there's this concept called irritability all right which some of you might be feeling because you've had to sit here and suffer through this video this whole time but really in the physiological sense irritability simply means that you're aware of something and you can move so for example you put your hand on a hot stove and boom you take it off okay you immediately sense it so that's that. Um, all of this will be on the test on Tuesday. Um, and if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Otherwise, I will assume everything's hunky-dory, and I will see you then.